name is Jess Talmage. Uh, my name's Bill. My name is Zoe Johannes. My name's Mikey. Serenity Linus. Uh, Al Herrera. I'm Francis Bowen. Looking back now to 1983, I mean, it was a very, very different world. I mean, this was five years before Clause 28. I think it was 1982, I, I was performing in Edinburgh, but I came down to the CHE conference, and I think it was then that Graham McCarrow and... Michael Mason, who ran Capital Gay. I think we, we got talking then that they felt London should have a gay community choir. I think on the grander scheme, it is really important that we, as gay people, keep performing and showing people that we are gay and that we are proud of being gay and that we're going to continue to show people that there's nothing wrong with being gay, we're great. I, I was very friendly with Rose Collis, who did the gay column, I, I think they were the gay column in, in Time Out, and then City Limits came out of a split, and a lot of people went with City Limits, and Rose probably introduced me to Brian Kennedy, and, and we became friends. I can't remember the first time I met Brian Kennedy, but he, but he was just, I mean, he was always incredibly enthusiastic about things and, and wanted, and, and, and it was a genuine passion. It wasn't, it wasn't, I want to get ahead. But Rose, Rose actually tells me that apparently the, the very last issue of Gay News had an ad for what became the Pink Singers. And it, the first meeting was at the Oval. I think there were something like 12, 12 people there. Um, I was very, very glad that there were women there. The, the women were, didn't want to be stereotyped. They wanted to sing tenor. There were, there were two, two guys who I think were from Hampstead who were in jumpers, uh, the cardigans. And, and, and it was, I mean, they, they were rather sort of looked down on by, by some of the sort of more radical people. But it was an incredibly radical thing that they were doing to actually stand up in public and say, I'm in a gay choir, that means I'm gay. I guess, yeah, certain communities, they are not really um, aware of LGB, LGBT people or the fact that these people actually exist, you know. I guess it's fine for London, but if you go to like certain cities around the world whereby it's like criminalised or where people are still fighting, LGBT people are still fighting for their rights, the fact that, you know, these social groups, these LGBT social groups um, exist, um, would go a long way in terms of helping these communities and spreading the message that you know we too are just regular people wanting to live our own lives. So there were there were two things that we brought along. We'd asked people if they had music to bring music. Um, one was a very simple round of which which is which is a great way of, of starting an evening of singing. Um, and, and, and we sang homos the word homos homosexual, homosexual, lesbian, lesbian, we are all homosexual, we are all homosexual, we are gay, to Frère Jacques. And, and we spent, you know, I mean, must, we must have spent about 45 minutes getting that really good. Um, and the other thing was a, a, a piece of sort of mock play chant called Veni, as in I come. I think we did Sunday afternoons and then the Thursday ten days later and then the Sunday... Ten days after that, um, and we always used to go to on the Sunday afternoon. We used to, we used to go to a, a, a rather good tea dance. I think when we started, it, it had already been decided by whoever the powers that be were that we would sing on the Pride Parade. And as far as I remember, we had a, we had a truck. Uh, we had a, we had a, because you were like you know you, you couldn't have floats but you could have a lorry at the beginning and a lorry at the end and we were on the lorry at the front and and we and we we sang um, Frere Jacques and and Veni um, over and over and over and and I think by that point we we were also doing Scarborough Fair. We went on a choir trip to Malta 
and uh, it was just a really good event to go to because I think we doubled the size of the Pride March, the 40 of us that were there, and it just showed the importance of, of Pride and um, the role that the choir can play internationally. And it was my first holiday with my girlfriend. And, 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 and it was always fun. I mean, we, we always, I, I, I enjoyed it all the time. But at the same time, I, I felt, I mean, I think my diary says something like, you know, it survived, the first meeting survived my incompetence. Uh, because it's just not, you know, it, it's a completely different skill. And when I've talked about when I've talked about this in the past, I've sort of I think I've always made it sound as though you know my arm was twisted and I did it and I didn't want to do it, which which was not not really the case. But but I did I did appear to have a career that was on an upward path, and I, apart from anything else, I didn't think it was fair that that it, that it wouldn't that the pink singers what became the pink singers wouldn't wouldn't be my my priority. Um, so, I mean, I said I would do it for three months and I didn't know what was going to happen. And Robert Kugel came up and said, I've just moved up to London. And, you know, I was conducting a choir in Salisbury. And um, would it be possible for me to do a number? And I said, I mean, I did literally said to him, better than that. You know, I'm leaving at the end of this afternoon, so if you'd like to take over the choir. And, and you know, I mean, you, you can't underplay what he did. They started in April and by about June Mark Bunyan was saying that he didn't want to run it long term, that he'd only taken it over as a figurehead to get the, the thing moving. And they were looking for somebody else to take over and nobody came forward. So I'd said to Richard that I'd be prepared to do it pro tem uh, because I'd actually run a, uh, a church community choir when I'd lived in, worked in Scotland. A very mixed ability group. So I agreed to take over and went along to a couple of rehearsals in June, July. Then the choir did the Pride March that year. Uh, and then I took over properly in the autumn when there was a very big sea change because during the July in the rehearsals it became apparent that a lot of people liked the idea of singing but didn't like the idea of rehearsing every week. So the group split into two. One was which was the people that were prepared to turn up every week and the other were the people that were just going to turn up ad hoc and I don't think the ad hoc group ever turned into anything, I'm not sure, but uh, I ended up with the rump of people who were wanted to turn up every week to rehearse and create something. I was already in a, a, a community choir at home, um, it was like a local community choir, and it wasn't, I felt like it wasn't really pushing me like musically, um, and that was the, one of the main reasons, because I wanted to feel that I actually had a standard, so I wanted to join a bigger choir. We started off with a few of the songs which Mark Bunyan had uh, learnt. Uh, half the group wanted to do show songs, by which I mean Gershwin, Cole Porter, those sort of thing. And the other half wanted to be political. So we mi mixed the two. Uh, I did arrangements of Gershwin, Cole Porter and songs from musicals. Uh, comic songs by Tom Lehrer and uh, Flanders and Swan. And then we did a funny old mixture of political stuff. It was very, it was very difficult to find the right uh, material. We used to do Glad to be Gay. That was the only, one of the few specifically gay political things that we actually did. Uh, one of the guys in the choir, John McLeod, was very keen on the music of Hans Eisler and had a lot of Eisler's stuff, some of which was written for uh, socialist workers choirs, others was written for actors to sing in plays and so we did quite a lot of Eisler, uh, Court Vile and later on I got in contact with the English communist composer Alan Bush who was then in his 80s, 90s and he lent us a lot of material that he'd written for workers choirs in the 1950s in England. That was the period of Section 28 
so that that was the other political demonstration was uh, was the anti section 28 which sort of rather merges into the minor strike in my fa my head i must confess it it was all part of the seemed to be all part of the same anti uh, thatcher uh, demonstrations up to 88 there was a very significant group of people in the choir who were there for political reasons. The change came in 87-88. Uh, a lot of the political people sort of retired and a number of people went and her, went to America to hear the, uh, to, to one of the American choir meetings came back with a lot of um, more, I don't know, sentimental ballad type repertoire, uh, which the, uh, the gay choirs sing in, London, in America, uh, and wanted to sing that sort of stuff, which was not in any way, shape or form politically involved. And the input of the choir, the, 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 uh, there was a slow turn, always a slow turnover of people, but what happened is between 87 and 88, the new people in the choir were all there, weren't, weren't particularly interested in being politically involved. They just wanted to sing. Because yeah, I think it's really nice with the, this choir is the fact that we have a really big repertoire and I think it's really nice for people to not specifically want to sing one kind of genre that there's, there's something for everyone basically yeah by 89 things were had changed and the need to be quite as politically engaged it's around that period that gay pride got fun uh, we I used to joke with my older political friends that basically we'd gone from the fighting for the right to be gay to fighting for the right to party yeah. And that, so the change in the Pink Singers happened at that time, I think, when uh, it was... Even though it's not quite as, um, you know, it's not, our existence isn't quite as political now as it used to be back, in, uh, back when we started in the 80s, um, I think that, that per we still serve that purpose when we go to other places, so other parts of the UK and also abroad as well, we still have quite a strong kind of political statement to make. I was having a drink in a regular pub that I used to go to nearly every evening and I was just quietly reading the newspaper. Friends of mine were arriving and I hadn't gone over to talk to them yet and a man came up to me and introduced himself and he said he was Robert Hugel and he was the conductor of a choir called the Pink Singers and they were looking for a pianist. In the early days of the Pink Singers, they really needed me as a pianist. If I hadn't been there, they wouldn't have had a pianist and they would have been in trouble. So I helped out certainly then. And then when the music director le was left, I was there ready to step up uh, onto the platform and be the conductor and take over and carry it on. While I was the music director, women joined the choir. Before I was the conductor, it was a men only choir. But when women came along to ask if they could join, I always said yes, welcomed them, sat them down and gave them some music. And by the next week, there were some specific things for them to do. I'd rewrite the arrangements to involve women. And then they brought their friends and slowly the number of women increased. When I first joined the choir, um, about 12 or 13 years ago, um, it was actually quite unusual for gay men and lesbians to mix. Um, so while there was a lot of gay culture out there in London, it was very segregated. Um, and I know a lot of people in the choir at the time felt, actually, I don't want to be an LGMC because it's just a male choir, or you know, I don't want to be doing something that's just for women or just for men. I want to do something where we're all in this together. And a lot of people really felt that it was a great place for gay men and lesbians to mix. Um, and to kind of to understand each other a bit more and kind of just to build bridges and that was really important to me. The first concert I conducted was the first concert that the Pink Singers gave with women and men in the concert. 
Before that, there were women and men together on marches, but it was the first concert. And for every single concert since then, there have been women and men in the choir. And that's something I'm extremely proud of. I think it's really easy for the gay community to be, to be quite disparate. Um, it's really nice to meet lots of lesbians because I don't really associate much with gay women or, or, or the gay community. So it, it's good, yeah, it's good for me. When I finished being the music director, the choir was about one third women. The music director that followed me was Paul Cutts and he took a very brave decision. He made the choir soprano, alto, tenor and bass. He didn't seem to mind that there were fewer women than men. He just wrote all the arrangements, soprano, alto, tenor and bass, which I would never have had the courage to do because I would have considered it to be unbalanced, but he did. And almost immediately, even more women started joining the choir because there were separate soprano and alto tenor and parts. And from that moment on, it was established. And I think that's been a remarkably good thing because there are very few lesbian and gay choir, bisexual and transgender uh, choirs in this world. We cover all those four bases and it's rare and I think it's a wonderful thing. I've made loads of friends over the years, people who I would never normally uh, paths would never cross, um, different age ranges, and, um, and it's just, yeah, um, fun, um, exciting, talented bunch of people. I think the choir has several purposes. Inherited from the early days is part of the gay liberation movement. We still sing a gay pride and at Gay History Month and at various ad hoc occasions for lesbian and gay organisations and that's, that's a great thing to do just in itself but then we also put on concerts which the general public come to in places where everybody else puts on concerts we do what everybody else does and we're, we're a, 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 an instance of lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual people doing what everybody else does saying to the world that we're part of the community of human beings and we want to be treated like everybody else, so we'll do what everybody else does. When I moved to London, I'd, um, I'd had quite a difficult time personally with coming to terms with my sexuality and coming from a, a family who were very working class, Welsh, Catholic. So I went along to a rehearsal that was at what was then the London Lesbian and Gay Centre in Farringdon on Cowcross Street. And uh, I remember it being one of the scariest moments of my life walking into that room because I didn't know where I was going and the rehearsal had already started. And I walked in and I thought, oh, you know, what, what's it going to be like? And um, it was fantastic. It wasn't really the sort of repertoire I was used to. I'd been singing Palestrina most of my life and I walked into show tunes. So that was a bit of a shock to the system. Basically what happened was that Michael Derrick, who you know, many people from the choir will know, he's been with the choir from the outset, um, wasn't able to come to a rehearsal and neither was our accompanist and I was the only person who had sort of any experience of conducting and, and could play piano. So I was asked by default to lead the rehearsal and Michael came to the rehearsal about halfway through and said, oh, looks as if we've got someone to take over. So I felt slightly sort of hoodwinked into becoming the music director, but that was really challenging for me because I was still, you know, quite insecure about who I was and suddenly I was being put on a public, very public, quite at the time political platform, you know, singing gay protest songs, um, standing up, acknowledging one's sexuality in public fora and on public stages around Europe and in America. And it was a hugely significant thing for me personally. But the thing that made it so wonderful was the people because here I was with a community of like-minded individuals whose sexuality was really important to them but whose actually sense of community was much more significant and that the way that they chose to express that together particularly gay women and gay men I felt was really really important. I think there is a need for an LGBT choir um, some people have said to me oh why do you have a gay choir um, I think partly that's jealousy because we have such a good time but I, I think it, in an ideal world it would be fantastic if we didn't have to but I also think 
But I do think that at the moment it's still important for people that aren't comfortable with their sexuality to come to a safe space and uh, you know, express themselves, be themselves. And I think the Pink Singers provides that. One of the loveliest things about that particular environment is that unlike other environments where groups of gay people gather, um, it doesn't have quite the same charged sexually charged atmosphere. That's not to say that there weren't lots of gorgeous people in the choir who you quite happily hop into the sack with. I mean, not that I did as music director, that would have been wholly inappropriate, of course. Um, but it's, you know, there's something, there's a very safe environment. So actually, if you are struggling to come to terms with who you are, but feel you want to be part of a community and, and start standing up for who you are, um, there's nothing like a choir to enable you to do that because it's a very safe, very supportive, very nurturing place. And the fact that those friendships continue um, beyond that time, you know, 20 years ago, um, I think is a real testament to the, the strength of community in that sense, and gay, lesbian community in particular. I came, I came out as trans and music is very, very gendered and it's quite hard to be trans and be a singer. So suddenly being able to have that back is, it was so amazing. And just being on stage and having everybody in front of me and going, yes, I'm singing, I'm singing with people, it's all working. It was just, it was a fantastic like, memory to have. But um, the choir was really special for me and I don't think I'd join another lesbian and gay choir if I lived in London. I think if I was going to go back to it, it would have to be the Pink Singers, um, partly because of the, you know, just the just really high standard and quality of the music making now. But I think I'd, I'd want to join them just because they were so important to me personally and how much they helped me grow and develop and hopefully how it helped me support and grow and nurture and develop other people. Yeah, yeah, so I'd say my friend Sam, um, he wasn't out to his parents and he sat, sat in one rehearsal and he was kind of so proud of what he was doing and so proud of the Pink Singers that, you know, that very evening he, he emailed them and told them um, that he was in a gay choir and then within two months they came and watched him and they've watched him ever since, which is great. Some of my most special moments were moments of the Pink Singers, you know, standing on the stage of the Seattle Opera House, conducting 12 people wearing silly hats um, at our first gala choruses sort of appearance, was an extraordinary thing to have a room of five and a half thousand other gay lesbian choirs cheering you when you finished. It was just an extraordinarily humbling and eye-opening and amazing thing. And there were so many of those experiences and particularly when we um, gave a number of our concerts in London at the London Lighthouse, um, the first AIDS hospice in London. Um, there, there were moments there that were truly profound, you know, people coming to our concerts in, on stretchers, um, in wheelchairs, in the days before there were, you know, reliable treatments for HIV and AIDS. And, you know, seeing the impact that, that those performances had on people um, in really challenged circumstances. Um, was incredibly powerful and we've, we lost a number of people in the choir and I lost uh, a friend um, not long after I started at the choir and that first concert after he died, he wasn't in the choir but he was involved in the sort of theatre and music industry, um, was a, I really felt that it mattered that we were singing there and that it was for him and for everybody else and for us too because there but for the grace of whichever God or not you might believe in or not um, go we and I think that was an incredibly profound experience so on every level the choir informed who I was how I thought how I behaved um, and my ambitions for, for myself for life and for the community at large and um, for that reason it will always have an incredibly important place in my life. I first joined the choir, it kind of all came together with me coming out because I got in with a group of friends who were trying different things and my friend Karen said, oh I really want to go along to this gay choir but I'm really nervous, will you come with me? I was not intending to go and sing or do anything. So I went along and it was the days when we were at the Drill Hall Theatre, which is a lovely theatre, it's the back of Gooch Street. And Karen ended up joining and I didn't and I thought it was great because I was there to see, to see my friend but I ended up spending quite a lot of time with the Pink Singers and I went on the um, Section 28 march when of the repeal of, for repeal of Section 28 when it was actually still 
in force um, and socialised a lot with choir and decided I'd join in the September. Sometimes we'd have a concert that had a theme, so we'd say, our oh, pinkies at the musicals, and we'd have different musicals, or we would have a fully classical concert. Um, and we found really the best mix was because our people, people that came to watch liked both classical and liked kind of more pop music, that some, although we had some specific concerts, we found if we had a specific classical, we'd get a slightly different audience to if we had a specific, I suppose, more high camp. Um, so that it became a balance between the two types of music. It's great because it's got there's got something for everyone in it. So I mean, if you're kind of, I mean, I know a lot of classical choral singers. So if if you're more hardcore into that, it's maybe not the best thing. But the great thing is, is if you like to actually have some fun versatility, then that's great because you know there's some jazz, there's some like classical stuff. There's there's a bit of everything. A big shift in choir came. We were always very restricted to not singing um, religious music. It was a really uh, strong point of the choir that they didn't want to sing religious music because of the way that various religions treat gay and lesbian people. Um, and that was a real shift that came in, I can't remember the year now, but came in. Um, and that then opened up a whole heap of other music that we never sang. And the idea was that we wouldn't try and sing from any particular religion but try and bring in music that was from different religions as well and different languages, oh the different languages. I've only done one big concert and that was um, summer last year St John's Smith Square with about 15 different languages and um, it was great, it was really hard work to learn it all and memorise all those languages and all those notes but to be on stage and to do it was just fantastic and then a fantastic party afterwards. I think expanding the description of what the Pink Singers who the Pink Singers are to encompass transgender um, was quite a big thing as well. For a time, it just the Pinkies just wanted to be known as lesbian and gay rather than anything else, whereas now it's much more encompassing. And for me, when the choir wasn't quite ready to make that step, and oh my word, the discussions about the nitty gritty of how we needed to phrase things and things was just whew, half the time over my head. But it, it was people felt very strongly about it. And for me, I felt very strongly we should be open and, and open and encompassing to all. But it took a while, I think, for the choir and for society and changes in the LGBT community to move on with that as well. Um, most of my straight friends and work colleagues and so on joined the concert, so I feel like they saw what I was doing. And it was the after party and it was just everyone from the choir together and all my straight friends and some of my gay friends and we were just all together and I was so happy. I think we have reflected the changes if from the change from it being men to being men and women to being all-encompassing and all-encompassing musically. That has been big changes, kind of mirroring society's changes and also the biggest change ever, which I was so grateful to be in that concert, singing with the children's choir. There was a big march through London which we participated in which is to try and repeal that act. And then now to be doing, and that was the first thing I did as with the Pinkies, um, and then to be singing with a children's choir those years on, shows how far it's come. I think it's important to have a strong presence and to, and to be there because we often sing with choirs and we always have emerging choirs in different areas of the country and okay, areas of London might be fantastic, but you go to other areas in the country, in the north of the country where I'm from and it's not, that you, you don't have that same that same level of, of, of acceptance um, and not only that you certainly don't in many areas of Europe and we sing with a lot of emerging European choirs so where well, we go and sing in Europe and, and, and backwards you know vice versa and that is something that we don't that that we're helping and inspiring other people and that's one of the things the Pink Singers has always done is try to sing with these emerging choirs we were the emerging choir at one point, trying to sing across Europe. Partly because we like travelling, but there was, all, if we're honest, we did and like going to other places. Um, but also, we liked singing with other people and seeing what you could create together. I went to um, a 40th birthday party of a good friend of mine who I work with at TNO, and I ended up 
playing the piano for one of them in the little cabaret he'd organised. And the final act in the cabaret was the Pink Singers, a small group, one of the famous small group gigs. Um, and I was outside and this Pink Singer came out slightly hysterical to say that unfortunately that very day they'd had a general meeting and lost their music director. And my ears pricked up and I thought, ooh, my, that sounds interesting, because I just heard them sing and I thought, oh, well, they're good. So I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose by applying. Which is what I did. And um, never imagined that I'd get it or really be able to, really be able to um, manage to do it. I think I sort of finally have found a community that kind of works for me. Is it the kind of family feeling about it? I think the thing that's personal most to me is the first time I ever came to the Pinkies, I was absolutely terrified. And I came away feeling like I'd had a big pink hug. And it was incredible. And that's the best thing about Pinkies. It, it's a kind of funny setup in the, in the Pinks because, sure, I'm paid to do it. So, so because of that, I'm sort of, it's my job. But yeah, it's also my social life, my hobby. Like I, I find that the people in the choir, um, really, there's, there isn't very anyone in the choir who might go, no, I don't like that person. I think it's quite um, more like a family almost. Like you can see that I'm, I'm making a hugging action, yeah. I love having, you know, a group of people with same really kind of diverse opinions and views about the best way of doing things. And in the end, you know, I'll put in my, my views as, as I'm sure anyone watching this from the Pink Singers will know, you know, I, I won't hold back if I've, if I've got something to say about it, but, you know, I, what I can bring is my experience of choirs, my experience of community, and it is a little bit like a church in a way. <laughs> For me, um, having grown up in a um, religious community, I find this is my, basically, this might be an appropriate church replacement activity. So it's my community thing, it's an identity thing, um, and it's really strengthening when we live in a majoritively heterosexual world, and it's really nice for me um, to have my identity reflected as I am, how I look, whatever, just as the gayness. Another bit about myself I sort of recognised quite early on is I, you know, I do have you know, one or two friends that I've kind of had for a very long time, but I, I, and I, I've, but I very often look at, at people who have life, lots of lifelong friends, and I just don't have very many of those. I have one or two very precious special ones, but, but I'm just kind of a serial best friend person. <laughs> but I really feel that I'm sort of making friendships now, the sort of friendships that I wished I'd had before. You come here and you forget that being gay isn't normal. You f you just everyone is themselves and everyone is celebrated for being themselves and it feels like a, it sounds really cheesy, but it does feel like a big family and everyone is accepted. And just that feeling of, of 80 friends all around you is brilliant. When this came up, it, it just seemed the perfect chance to, to be part of a, a slightly more specific LGBT um, Group. because as, as I think I said earlier I hadn't ever been involved in anything like that before so I've still got a lot to catch up on I really? you know well it was the, the concert we just did with the Pink Singers where we did the retrospective of 30 years and, 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 and the kind of the history the sort of movement if you want to call it that yeah. in this country I was I'm, I'm pretty ignorant about a lot of that I feel that there's something about kind of coming together and creating that community and the sort of strength that comes out of that and the way that we've sort of politicised people through doing that. I actually find that quite appealing, um, which probably sounds really um, nefarious, but I think this whole exercise, you know, the whole thing of making this exhibition and the 30th anniversary year and all the various things that we've done around that have been a massive consciousness raising exercise and as somebody who works in public history which is you know basically what I do I find that very appealing you know I really like that aspect of it and um, yes it's very satisfying <laughs> I never imagined I'd have time or space or you know professionally or socially to sort of do this but actually um, it's it's been completely life-changing it's um, brought me into contact with a whole bunch of people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. Um, it's opened up all kinds of kind of doors that I never imagined going through.
Uh, we're a community choir. In a community, um, people who just love singing. About 40% um, singing and 60% social, I suppose. It's a fun, unpretentious choir um, that supports all of his members and hopefully acts as an inspiration to other people as well. We're a choir that's made up of LGBT people, but being LGBT is just one part of the choir, just like being LGBT is just part of each of our own personal identities. Really welcoming, really inclusive, lots of fun. One big gay family of pinkness. I'd probably just say the choir's changed my life.